Welcome to Burrows and Burbs with hosts John Ingle and Roberto Cabrera. Over the next hour, you're going to learn some insider knowledge that will help you overcome and strategize in the cutthroat world of real estate. Now, here are your hosts, John and Roberto. Welcome, everybody. Episode 104, Waterfront Dreams. Roberto, I can't believe it's taken us three years to get a show done on waterfront homes. I mean, this is what everybody wants, right? This is lifestyles of the rich and famous. This is what we're all aspire to be. And it's taken us three years. What happened? And I don't know why. I don't know why. You go out to the Hamptons for it. I hang, I live in Connecticut for it. And yet, look, Scott Hobbs can't get away from it. And yet three <laughs> years later, here we are, episode 104, Waterfront Dreams. I want to introduce two of the best waterfront designers, Mary Burr and Ryan Salvatore of Burr Salvatore Architects. Say hello. Hi, Thank everyone. you for having us. Yeah, thanks we're, so much. We're so excited to have you. And I've got Scott Hobbs to ask the really hard questions because he builds houses on the water. And uh, so he knows enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Why are we doing it now? Well, it occurs to me that waterfront has never been hotter than it is right now. We've got the $90 million waterfront sale in Darien after, what, 20 years of trying, boom, this month, somebody buys nine, uh, $90 million of waterfront Darien, $150 million in Greenwich. Oh, my God. And, of course, you've got Japan Point, which has been, what, hot for 100 years. Uh, you had a $7.5 million sale uh, on the end of the point only probably a year ago. Uh, so... Um, reason number one, waterfront's never been hotter. And reason number two, it's hurricane season. So that's why we want to talk to the builder and the designer about the, 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 the things you need to know about being on the water. So with no further ado, let me just thank our sponsor, Grace Farms, home to Design for Freedom, aiming to end forced labor and building materials for our spaces. Um, I want you to use promo code BURBS at sharegracefarms.com for 10% off your first order of their coffees and teas. I'm going to show that on the screen right now because I am so digital. See, that's, that's their coffees and teas. And we'd like you to support Grace Farms and Design for Freedom um, by going to sharegracefarms.org. And without further ado, let's, let's get right into it. Mary Burr, Ryan, how long have you been doing this? So as architects, we've been practicing for uh, each of us about 10 years, although doing it together really for more like three. We, we, we both actually met in architecture school. I was a year ahead of Mary. Then each of us went to work at Robert Stern Architects. Um, I left, Mary left a few years later and, uh, and we teamed up in 2000. You, you glossed over the best point of our meeting though, which was, I was a year behind Ryan in architecture school and we were friends. We knew each other, but never romantic, never was there. We should say we're, we're, we're partners married. in life and business. Important qualification here. Otherwise this could sound weird. Yeah. <laughs> and then in my last year of architecture school, Ryan called from Robert Stern trying to recruit me. Uh, and I was so charmed that I said, you know, I think I'll accept the job. And the rest was history. Mm. We only overlapped for about six months uh, at Stern's office before he left. And then I stayed for another six years. Uh, I should mention the time. educational pedigree of the two of you. You went to, <laughs> Ryan went to Princeton, but you went to Williams, which makes getting into Princeton looks like we're just walking into McDonald's. And ah. then you both, then you both go to Yale, you know, architectural school. I, just, I mean, is that what it takes to build on the waterfront? <laughs> No, I don't, no, I don't think so. I think we're both fortunate to have had those educational experiences, but clearly not. Um, uh, although I do think one thing that doesn't, both of us came from liberal arts backgrounds before we went to architecture school. And um, I do think that sort of informs our approach to things, just an awareness outside of architecture. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's the technical demands of building on the water. And then there's also like, how do you capture, and this is the stuff that we think about all the time, how do you capture the spirit of living by the water? What does it mean to live by the water? Yeah, you're confronting hurricane season, you're uh, thinking about where do you put condenser stuff like that. But, but more importantly, there is a lifestyle associated with waterfront living. And how do you embed that in the architecture such that the people who live there are experiencing it day to day, moment to moment? 
were you doing waterfront your entire career? I mean, was were they were you working on this in the Stern days, or has this been um, only in the last? Yeah, few years? actually, most of the projects that I worked on, at least at, at uh, Bob Stern's office, were were waterfront, either on the lake. Uh, I I worked on a project on Lake Michigan. That was a, a pretty major house that I spent about four years on actually. Uh, and another project uh, on Lake Skinny Adelies, um, up, upstate, uh, Hamptons. Yeah, what about you? I, I worked on, I was only in Stern's office for about 18 months and I worked for the entire time on one project. It was a house um, on the vineyard, not on the water, but proximate with some, some distant views, really special property and special house. Um, so, so related and certainly part of this, this whole kind of cultural movement, you know, how do you capture this, the spirit of that lifestyle? Um, and then before that, so I, before going to architecture school, I spent about eight years as a general contractor and did a fair number of, of waterfront or, or water proximate projects. So it was pretty familiar, certainly with a lot of the technical stuff, uh, as a result of that experience. It's interesting because I never I'll only think of that firm as a New York building buildings in New York. <laughs> Yeah, they have, they have a few studios. They're divided into studios and a few of them that just do houses. And actually, most of them are single family houses outside of the city. Uh, so oh. that's where we cut our teeth. And I think as a result, we have a very sympathetic way of working, not just stylistically in terms of design, but also the way we run our practice. It's formulated on our experience at Bob Stern's office where there's a great culture. Um, so really, I think each of us had great experiences there. Uh, a really wonderful place to, to start a career. And also for the people who've stayed, spent their whole lives. I mean, the people that we day to day look up to, whether Bob or the partners that we work for, I think oftentimes we're thinking in the office, you know, yeah. what would this person do in this situation? They're, it's a great model and example. I think. So real important touchstone for us. So when we took, so now we've established that the people who want to build on the water, they hire, they're, they're buying some of the most expensive real estate in the country, uh, really unique properties with unique challenges, and they want to hire the best. And they go to a place like Robert Stern and, the, and they hire the best in the country. Uh, and you've been working so at, at Stern on these is it located mostly in the Northeast and is it mostly oceanfront or have you also worked on projects uh, both in Florida and as you mentioned, Lakeside? Um, have you worked all over the country or are we talking about a concentration in the Northeast? I think at Stern's office, it's, it's much more nationally and in fact, internationally and, and lots of different types. In our practice, it's really been much more concentrated in the Northeast, but on a variety of different sites, whether it's uh, fronting on the sound, whether it's fronting on the Atlantic Ocean, in fact, working on projects for, in each location with, with Scott and his team, actually. Um, so, so a variety of, of settings for, for the work, which is actually really exciting because each one invites a different opportunity, a different design possibility. So the, I think that some of the ones that you were that were sent over that we could talk about, let me see if I can pull them up on the screen and maybe you could walk us through what some of these are and some of the design challenges that went into them. So walk us through some of these case studies. So this first one, I believe, is in Stanford, Japan, maybe on Japan Point. Take it is, yeah. Um, and, and for really special clients, wonderful people who I think of in many ways uh, 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 as like the Medici's uh, of, I, 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 this was one of the first projects I had worked on. Interesting backstory. I, when I was in the construction business, I had done a gut renovation of this house for other clients. Those clients sold the house to the current owners. And when they moved in I, as a contractor, I had just done some superficial stuff for me, you know, some tile, paint, whatever. Fast forward, like, I don't know, three or four years later, I had gone to architecture school and it might've been right as I was leaving architecture school, I got an email from the client saying, listen, we really need a trash enclosure. Do you think this is something you could design? Of course, like every architecture student's ears are up about a trash enclosure. Could you get a more exciting project? Anyhow, you know, I'm intentionally being sarcastic, nothing ever materialized. But so then like about a year and a half later, I got a call and this time Mary was still at Stern's office. I had just left um, and they, they said they had bought the property next door, which included another, a main house that dated um, from the early 1900s and the barn that you see on the left. And they said, we want to think of this as a, as a family compound, a place where our two kids and our grandchildren can come from wherever they're living. And really it's like the homestead for the family. 
And um, it was a real, and actually we're still, you know, always doing small things there. Really, really fun project, right? Fabulous west facing views on the harbor. This is the cottage building where the clients decided, you know what, we want the exterior to really be sympathetic with the, with the rest of the house, the main house, but the interior, can we do something a little more whimsical? Let's, this is our escape from the 1950s and 60s, the, the, the um, uh, uh, mid-century world. And the, the client actually did all of the decorating in here fabulously with a lot of original pieces. Um, but it really was meant to be like a retreat um, and almost like a folly on the property, but undergirding that was the mandate that we needed to do it. We maintained three separate parcels. And in order to build a pool, uh, the city of Stanford has regulations such that you can't have an accessory structure without a principal structure. So that cottage was really a one, one room apartment that satisfied the need for a for an accessory building. This is the barn, which dated from the 1860s. It had been elsewhere on the property originally. When we found it, it was really in shambles. I mean, it was a workshop and a, and a I'll use the word not really appealing um, apartment upstairs. We shaved off the west facing elevation, introduced this entire post and beam system, and um, really just tried to open it up to the water views beyond. Um, and this is a guest house for the um, property overall. Did you expand this at all, or is this all within the pre existing structure? So all within the pre existing structure, actually, if anything, we carved away square footage because this front half was not open at all, two stories. So we opened it up as a way to develop views from the primary bedroom through the living room out to the water because because the building is oriented the wrong way in a sense. The short end fronts the water, but yet we wanted to try and capture views from as many rooms as we could. A really special project for wonderful people. So what type of glass do you have to use that's that can withstand wind, that can withstand you know, the sunlight, you know, yeah. it's, I, I guess sound isn't necessarily an issue, but um, I mean, so what, what sort of glass is that? That we, we on, on that west elevation in particular, we originally started with an Italian manufacturer, it's triple laminated um, uh, glass uh, in, and, and the original iteration actually had a almost like a minivan door on its side. By the way, this project that's up is one that we just wrapped up with, with the Hobbs team. Yeah. A really fabulous project about 10 or 12 houses up the shore um, from the, the one we were just looking at. But anyhow, the the um, so th you know all of the windows were were, were tinted to for UV protection on upholstery because they're west facing. Um, the, the, in that particular instance, we didn't have to hurricane rate them um, or meet some of the standards that you might find, for example, down in Florida, Miami Day, Miami Dade. But really being very much aware of sun influences and comfort because you have to amp up HVAC. You have to think about what it's like to be in front of that window at three o'clock in the afternoon on a summer day. Like there's no benefit to having glass if it's really uncomfortable to be there. Yeah. Here a little bit more transitional project, um, not on water, but off water, um, inspired very much by nautical influences, but trying to do it in a way that was a little bit more innovative that the, um, so some of these rounded steel members here, there's, there's like actually a, a, a metal cage floor of the loft to make it feel a little bit more open, but not so um, literal in its, its um, appropriation of, of nautical or maritime architecture, um, trying to do it in, in kind of fresher, more contemporary language. This too was a pre-existing structure or not? No, this was a new house. So you designed, are there, are there, are there, are there any... Um... Uh, like zoning restrictions or, you know, uh, a, a style that you have to maintain or heights, you know, what, what restrict, did you have any restrictions in creating this? Well, I, I, I mean, I remember that we needed a variance for this because it's on a corner site. Uh, and one of the hardships of being on a corner site is that you have two front yard setbacks. The front yard setbacks are generally deeper than side yard setbacks. Um, but we were able to get that variance. Yeah, I think we had a legitimate case for it. I mean, I, I, in many cases, it's not so much a um, a local or uh, whether whether regulatory or association based guideline that drives some of our thinking about, let's say, context, but more our interest in it. Like, I think the last thing that we want is really to drive by and know that house was built in 2019. Um, that's not to say it has to be duplicative of the context it's in, but really more like okay, this fits in massing wise, this, this feels comfortable on the site. It looks like it belongs here. 
Like that to us, I think is is a, a kind of one of the key hallmarks of a design that's that's worth building. That's going to stand the test of time. It's such a compliment when someone doesn't know if it's if it's old or new too. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> So generally, I, I was reading in one of your, your studies that it was something to the effect of you were saying, you know, in building, we don't want it because of, of views, we don't want to necessarily cheat any room of having some opportunity to experience that view. And the general thinking is that you would make a house that's kind of long, but you could also, I, I'm assuming you could also make it tall. Is it are there, is there any general thinking though that because you're on the water, because of the weather, because of the winds, that generally building high is less desirable or there's a limitation to it, or does that matter? Well, I would say two, two answers to that. One, there, there is a practical uh, limitation of a building height restriction. Uh, but two, when we're building, uh, we build in many different styles, but Oftentimes on the water, we're looking to shingle style precedence. And the shingle style is known for its rambling quality. It's not super tall. In fact, oftentimes the eaves dip really low and the roof is very all encompassing. And it's, it's kind of the opposite of these houses that you see that have been raised out of the ground artificially in order to avoid the, the floodplain. Um, so I would say that that was an aesthetic reason as well as the effect that of course every room does want a view to the water so you often have a single loaded corridor uh with with all of your bedrooms along that corridor so that everyone gets a view i mean if, if you just the images that you just had up in the house um the back of the house with the awnings i mean that's a perfect case where we actually graded up to the house because we really wanted it connected to the grid and and when you think about again the the benefits of waterfront living like the idea that you could walk out of your house and feel connected to the shore, to the beach beyond, to just literally meander through your, your garden to your kayak. Like all of that gets to the core of why it is so special to live on the water. Now, the exception is go out to a, a, a beach, you know, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Green Hill Beach or Charleston Beach in, in Rhode Island, right? Those are beach cottages up on pilings. That's a different type of thing, right? But in, in certainly in the Southwestern Connecticut setting, where the, the the houses are typically rooted in the ground, totally different um, uh, approach where you really want to feel connected to the ground plane. Uh, and we really fight in big ways to enhance that connection um, rather than pushing things out of the house. And actually, you know, urbanistically, you think about places like Rowain. Rowain is such a fabulous place. It's density, the character of the houses. But what you see there, Old Greenwich, et cetera, is as people have to confront some of the flood regulations, the houses pop up out of the ground and it begins to compromise the wonderful streetscape. Um, so anything we can do to mitigate that, like we go out of our way and think a lot about it. Is there any sort of, uh, is there a different, like the foundations of these houses? I'm assuming there's no basements. Um, what sort of, are, are, <laughs> is there anything specific that you have to do here for these houses? On these ones that we're looking at now, in fact, this particular site, nothing specific. These were out of the flood zone. Um, on one of the earlier ones, it's a, a crawl space with a little bit more robust foundation system. You can't use it for storage. The pool house on that property, I think you could probably launch a, launch a space shuttle from because of the flood <laughs> regulations mandating certain structural requirements. Um, we're working on one right now where we have an 11 foot deep foundation with 24 inch thick slab because of risks around hydrostatic pressure that is water groundwater coming up that might push the foundation up and also waterproofing really sophisticated waterproofing systems um, right on the water. Um, so it really depends site to site, but I think outside of certain regulations that prohibit uses in certain ways, and there are a lot of those, um, it's sort of the construction technology has evolved in a way such that we can sort of do anything um, and and really use that space if the regulations would permit us. I'm and, looking at the picture and if the client has the right budget. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Important consideration there. Uh, I'm looking at the picture now, where and I've just noticed this very subtle uh, uh, fencing on the right side. And I would think that fencing is one of the most critical things you could do, both fencing between your neighbors, and in this case, the fencing on a retaining wall to meet code. But nobody likes to look at, at unnecessary fencing. So 
uh, it strikes me that you're innovating, you and other architects are innovating with materials uh, in ways that you couldn't do even 10 years ago. I think no question. And, and, and I think the vendors are pushing it in a big way too. Like we constantly have vendors coming through our office, introducing us to the new things that are on the market and like huge new opportunities as a result of that. I mean, that, that glass is coated with a particular film that limits how dirty it can get so that the salt spray or whatever coming up from the water isn't a constant um, pain in the neck to deal with. Um, subtle things like that, that just make all the difference for the person who ends up using it. Wow. I mean, you know, what can I say, but wow, um, to, to have to think through the details of salt spray and humidity, uh, it also occurs to me that if you ask me to design a house, I guess my uh, initial assumption is I take out a sheet of paper and I assume I get a nice flat piece of land. But it strikes me as I look at these images that you have very complex sets of levels that you have to raise these houses above sea level significantly, but you have to do so in an elegant way so that it's not towering over its neighbors, that it's not using fill or retaining walls in inappropriate ways and, and making it an awkward uh, series of levels. So can you talk to us about, you know, trying to site it close to the water and yet with the limitations of retaining walls and, and levels and stepping down? I mean, I think the, the stepping down is an advantage. We always think that it's a more uh, interesting building section when uh, there's a series of, of interior terraces. And as Ryan already mentioned, we want to connect the indoors to the outdoors as much as possible. So oftentimes we end up grading up to the house. Yeah, I mean, I, as I think about this image in particular, um, this is the backside of the cottage that that the windows upstairs are looking out to the sound, but the, the other side is the street side and there's a significant great difference. And although this is a relatively tight site, it's a waterfront site, always there are limitations on area versus for example, if we're working in backcountry Greenwich where there's a lot more space, but some of the strategies that one might encounter for a site like that, the kind of classic approach to a, to a manor house where you weave around and you discover outbuildings on the side or you come around a corner and, and the vista to the house opens up those same themes we were trying to use here so the driveway comes down and, and although you might glance a vista of the house off to the corner really you're focused on the barn and the tree you come around the corner and discover the house and the grade is all part of that the, the transformation from street, the threshold across the piers into the driveway, making one's way down the procession, something we always talked about, whether at architecture school or Stern's office, where is the front door marking where that point of entry is? And, and it doesn't have to be heroic. I think that that comes down to, to style in many respects, but, mm -hmm. but that one should always know how to get into the building um, and, 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 and that procession and sequencing is so critical to and that. And often it's a subtle, signal. A lot of our clients these days want a service entrance as well as a main entrance where guests come to. And sometimes the service entrance is where, where they park, you know, it's around the side where the garage is, where they will be parking daily as well. Uh, but subtle cues like we might change from a Belgian block or a paved driveway to gravel. That signals to someone who's never been to the house before, okay, the gravel, that's more casual. That's the side entrance. The the Belgian block or the brick driveway. That's the main entrance. That's the one I'm going to follow. Uh, so we think about that, and we work with landscape architects uh, on all of these projects, on nearly all yeah. all of them, I would say. I mean, I think in this one in particular, the landscape architect um, was Bruce Sellers, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. But he he brilliantly developed almost a series of outdoor rooms using the grade. Um, and so as you move down the steps and through the site, you have a different character to each of these areas. Up at the front. Right, there's a very formal parterre that leads you to the front door, but way down by the water is much more casual. The paving becomes more organic with moss growing up between it and, and a real seaside landscape of Rosa Ragosa and grasses along the seawall that it, it really, the, 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 the transformation from the street to the water is so complemented by the landscape design, whether here and, and really every one of our projects, that's the case. <laughs> Uh, uh, one of the questions I, I set up before, and I want to turn this over to Scott Hobbs next and get his perspective on on, on building on the water, but um, one of the questions I sent was the design trends question, and this picture 
I think illustrates it well. There's a there's a tendency to want to go traditional cottage, and yet in this photo we also see sort of the the modern uh, barn to the left with the steel roof. I guess that's a steel roof. Um, so can you talk to us about where the trends are going? Are we getting away from traditional because we don't want to uh, puncture a wall with windows? We want to make the wall a window. So can you talk to us about that? Well, I don't think we're getting away from traditional. There is a big movement for, for this, what, what people call transitional. Um, you've seen the modern farmhouse, right? You've seen the white modern farmhouse with black windows that is ubiquitous right now. Uh, and, and I'll confess, we, we did one ourselves in 20, 2018, uh, but that has become such an overused trend, especially in this area. Um, and, and I think the perpetuation of trends is probably aggravated by, by everyone being on Instagram and seeing the same images. Um, but I think that what we try to, we try to look at precedents that are not um, just contemporary precedents because that endangers us to falling into that trap and, and following trends. Um, but we look at a lot of earlier examples um, and I mean, you began by saying you want to make sure that when you're done, they can't tell what year the house was built. I'm wondering, did your client say to you, I want a normal looking house here. Give me a traditional looking house, but I want a lot of windows so I can look at the water, but I want a traditional looking house. And that's what you're calling tra transitional. So it's interesting. I, I mean, one of the questions we'll often um, ask clients in our earliest meetings just from a process standpoint, the first meeting we have after we've, you know, sort of been signed up, the first meeting we have with clients is really we just sit down and talk. We want to build a narrative for what this project is about. And, and we'll often ask clients, can you name the project? And in strange ways, that naming exercise begins to inform parts of the project in ways that you'd never imagine. So anyhow, but one of the questions we'll usually ask is, okay, on a scale of zero to zero to 10, zero being the glass house and 10 being the white house. Where on that spectrum do you do you want to be? And we feel comfortable across that spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, we really feel strongly about that. That um, it's not everything is a white box, not everything is a salt box, but it's really response to client desires, site, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what's also interesting about that is when you hear, well, a couple of things. First of all, we might be talking uh, with, with clients, a husband and wife, and, and one says there are two and the other one says an eight, and we have to figure out how to melt those two. Um, but also like the person who says, you know, I'm, I'm really an eight. I am looking for something super modern. And it turns out really what they meant is I want a, um, a traditional white kitchen with some chrome knobs. Like it, how, how to understand what that means, modern or contemporary, it, it it varies so much from person to person. Um, I think though that it, if you look at the, the the evolution of of houses, particularly along the water, from let's say the turn of the century to the present, clearly there's been a movement to add much more glass. That's that's partially because the building technology has improved much more, so that glass doesn't mean drafty, glass doesn't mean leaky. There are better ways to do things now that really afford the opportunity to engage the water on the site much more um, for, for obvious reasons. Um, but the question is, how do you do it in a way that doesn't scream glass box, glass box, if that's not the ambition? And sometimes that is the ambition and that's great. All right, Scott. So when they come back and they say, I want a glass box and the architect says, okay, I'll give you a glass box, massive glass windows. <laughs> and then you say, you can't have that. Does that happen? Or do they, I mean, what's the relationship between client, builder, and architect? And w at what point do you say, no, you can't have that? Well, I think one of the biggest challenges is, is when people start working with the architect, this is really the dream phase. And it is, as Mary and Ryan brought up, I mean, it, it takes, a, most clients can't describe what they ultimately want at the first meeting. And sometimes they can't describe it by the 10th meeting. And so the architects are working through this long process and finally you get everyone excited and you're, you're working through the issues. And maybe at some point you talk budget, but along the way, the dream sort of took over. So for, unless there's a builder involved early, then sometimes, you know, the dream shows up and we get to be the wet blanket. And so <laughs> there's a, you know, there's a $5 million budget and we do a quick takeoff. And we're like, well, I hope your budget's around 10. 
And that that's really a big problem because it's it's you know there's no way to reconcile those two things together unless the client really has kind of a you know the budget is kind of irrelevant to them but budget tends to be relevant to almost. Does everything. that happen because the architects aren't clued into what things cost or because waterfront costs more to build? I, I would say this is an endemic to to the whole custom design process, and it's not. It, I, I wouldn't blame it on the architects. I mean, admittedly most architects aren't as keyed into today's pricing as contractors are for a long period of time there's not a lot of inflation so you know if you built a, if you got your last round of pricing was two years ago that's great it doesn't really matter but like over the last two years pricing has been crazy inflationary and even guys who you know you get a bid one month and the next month the, the bid is wildly different so you have no concept as to what's going on that hopefully is leveled off but I really think it's part of the dream, the dream factor that, um, you know, one of our project managers once put out there that, you know, we're not building housing, we're in the entertainment business. And in that entertainment business, it's the whole design process, it's the, you know, the end product, it's the, you know, how, how people are going to use it. You know, th this is not a, a, a four walls and a roof over your head. This is something that's exciting to do, and that's exciting to live in afterwards. And that process again you can't stop every way along you know you can't get in the way of the creative process and sit there and keep hammering away at dollars without hurting that process now having a contractor involved in order to help keep everyone go design is awesome you guys are so excited this looks incredibly great everyone realizes that we've surpassed the last budget and we're heading in a direction that's going to be more expensive and if people like it most of the people who can buy waterfront houses and build custom can afford to spend more if they're getting something they like. If they're not getting something they like, then why should they spend more? So it's kind of that, that check in between there. And that's one of the most difficult parts because ultimately we can build anything. It just is that question as to, you know, what are people willing to pay? And then there's trade, then there's a whole long process with the architect and builder and finding the best way to do it to meet, to match those, uh, the vision with what's the most practical long-term solutions at the best budgets. You know, we how do you almost, do? almost always we'll say to clients in the early phases, the very early phases of design, like before, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll want to know big picture budget, but then we say, you know what, let's just put the budget aside for a little while. Let's draw the best possible thing we can draw for what you've told us you want. And you know what? Almost certainly we can guarantee you that this is going to be over your budget, but we'd rather put the best ideas out there and come back. And it's a grueling process to say, you know what? I love that. I love that. But it forces a certain degree of discipline from everybody on the team, whether it's us, the clients to prioritize, like this is the most important thing. And then you know what? Okay. We couldn't do this other thing, but there's a kernel of an idea there. And how do we do that more affordably? Um, or more economically, whatever the case may be. Where you and, start with teasing me with something I can't afford. It's, 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 it's like a real estate purpose. Yeah, you I mean, a house you can't I mean, afford. We try to do it in a way that it's not 4X what you can afford, right? But but it, we think, and, and it takes a lot, honestly, it takes a lot more effort from us because then we're redrawing, we're redoing it. But it, it honestly yields the best outcome or it yields an outcome that everybody's comfortable with. It puts the client in the driver's seat to say, you know what, these are the things that are most important to me. This is where I want to focus. And we always do more than one offer for the same for the same reason. The client usually likes A from scheme one and B from scheme two, and then we Frankenstein them together to something that looks good uh, but includes everything they want. Yeah, Frankenstein might not be the best verb. <laughs> I, I, th I think the buying process of, of purchasing an apartment is completely the opposite. Is that you start at a certain place with the basics and you allow them to keep growing it because they'll do it on their own. And they come the whole way up. If you show, if you actually let them feel, touch, and taste something that they can't afford, and then you come back down, the process also becomes depressing. Mm -hmm. So it's but different. I don't know. It feels Roberto, different there from. There might be a, a little difference here that in a custom project, let's just say that a, a waterfront lot costs $5 million. And in some places, it costs a lot more than that. Sure. And let's say you're going to build a house. And let's say that the basic house at which you'd be marginally happy is going to cost you $5 million. And then you've got $2 million worth of furnishings and you've got a million dollars worth of fees. So you're in here already at $14 million and you have a nice house. Now, if it was 15 million and you were really excited or 16 million and you're over the moon every time you drive home, 
you know, we're talking about the marginal last dollars as opposed to on an apartment where it's like, I'm, I'm you know, here's the budget. This is it. What I'm buying is what I'm getting. I'm not, there, there's not a whole ton of the variable. And ultimately, I think even with a bunch of clients that, you know, if somebody has a $5 million budget for their apartment and you show them a 15 million, all right, that's probably irresponsible. But if you show them a six, people might go, it's worth it for this extra. Of course, of course, but they will grab it. They will do And they start getting excited. They grow into the process. Like now this is what I'm talking about. You know, they keep coming and keep coming and you allow them to do it. It's also a matter of trust. We have a bad reputation. You start taking them to places. They're just like, they just want to make a commission and sell you something. And that's just not the, pro you know, it's a process. It really is. You're getting to know people. It's a relationship. I'm sure that you guys, it's the same thing. You know, you have the wife calling you saying, look, he's going to tell you he wants the kitchen this way. And he's going to say, don't tell her. She's going to call you this. And you're right in between. You know? What? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> At what point will I know what it's going to cost me that we're into this? We're going to be into this for 14 and how solid are we on that 14? I say that because I have a client in town who was going to expand their starter house. And mm -hmm. now they're realizing that it's going to be $4 million project. And they got bummed out. They thought it was going to be a $3 million house. Now it's a $4 million house. So they went looking and they went and they said, you know what? We're just going to sell it and go buy ourselves a $3.5 million house. They're bummed out because prices, somehow prices just went up 33%. Um, what when they weren't when they blinked, is that a function of the architect not setting the expectations during the process? Is that a function of where we are in the economy today? Um, and how often is that happening these days? So we almost always, at least for a new house, will bring the builder in pretty early on, bring a builder in, not necessarily the builder we end up using, but oftentimes it is to do what we call gut check pricing, where they look at our fairly schematic drawings, but we'll accompany it with a, a written narrative saying, you know, we're using say Marvin windows and uh, cedar shingles and you know, give, give them some, some outline. Uh, and they can give us a budget that's probably within 20% of what the house ends up costing. But it's not until we flesh out the drawings with all of the materials and have a really developed set of drawings that they can give hard numbers to that and even those numbers change but but also not to be the grim reaper here on the on you know grim reaper of architects but and this is a, i'm gonna I, I think i suspect among architects this would be an unpopular statement but certainly in the sector of, of architecture where we're doing most of our work which is the single family residential market right architecture is a luxury custom design is a luxury and the reality is for most projects Somebody who hires an architect to design something specific to them, hires Hobbs to build it for them, they're not gonna be in the money on the project at the end of the day. There is a certain utility that comes from the customization to it at, at the end product. And also as Scott was describing the process, this is a fun process. We say it to clients all the time. If you're not having fun in this, that's really unfortunate. We need to make it fun because how often are you gonna spend this kind of money on something? Like think of this as the best vacation you've ever taken. And, and that's, it, there's a certain utility to that process that has to be factored into what this cost is. It's not all about, okay, well, I put X into it, I can get Y out of it, because it just doesn't work in the custom market. And that's, a, that's actually, a tough pill to swallow. Although it did actually work for that brief moment in COVID. I mean, anyone that built in 18, 19, 20, 21, uh, they, made a, they would have made a lot of money if they sold, but then they couldn't ever buy anything, and they certainly couldn't buy what they actually had, you know, just created. Um, and, and I think that Ryan brings up again, the great point that, and Mary also, and that you, know, you try to set up budgets, inherently the system has a problem that when owners are asking contractors, what do you think this is gonna cost? The contractors aren't stupid because what do you think the owners wanna hear? A high number or a low number? I mean, it's like, we just wanna know the truth. And really the answer to that is like, or the, the question back on that is, well, when do you wanna know the truth? Because if, if you want to know the truth today and you're going to hire the guy that tells you something lower, it's not in my best interest to tell you the truth. Now, we really try to because we're, we're lucky under our reputation and, and we're trying to be honest with the people and we don't like the later discussions. Um, but we don't give a worst case scenario. I mean, it, it's, you know, and quite frankly, there is no worst case pricing scenario. All of our clients can exceed our wildest expectations on pricing. I mean, it, it, you can go entirely crazy 
And some people do. And by the way, if you get value from that and excites you and makes you happy, you should do that. But you know, the, ultimately the owner controls a lot of the pricing and the selections that they make are gonna drive that pricing. And if they don't know early on what they want, which most are not qualified to know, it's very hard to get the pricing correct. I, I use one extreme example that a client had said, you know, we just want to do sort of French country. And it turned out they wanted Louis the 16th. <laughs> and that's not, it's not the same zip code. I mean, it's mm-hmm. way off on that. So, you know, am I wrong on my budget or are they wrong on what they told us is for their expectations of what they wanted? Also, then there's a question of what are you building for? Are you building for a time timeline that's 25 years, that's 50 years, whatever the case may be, because that drives how things are detailed, how things are, are uh, you know, material selections that are made along the way. And all those ultimately drive the budget. And sometimes it's tough to ferret that out at the start of a project, too. So it looks like Perry uh, lives in a lighthouse. He's asking, is waterfront land worth more than the structure at the vineyard? And uh, I'll ask that question a different way. The example you used was $5 million piece of land, $5 million budget for the structure, plus another 14 of fees and, and decorating, et cetera. As the price of land, waterfront land went up, let's say from five to 10 or from 10 to 20, you know, for the very best spot on the point, uh, wherever that is, Florida, the Hamptons, wherever. As the l- price of land went up, did the budgets for construction and the budgets for uh, building these houses go up proportionately? That's a, that's a tricky one. <laughs> I mean, I'm interested in what you guys say also. I would say, yes, a bunch of the budgets have gone up because you know, in Greenwich, I mean, I, I don't know if you can get waterfront for under 10 million. I, mean, I, I don't know if there is- And nobody's a building a $5 million house on a $10 million lot, right? But then, but then you get into the size of the lot the, how the lot lays out, you know, as, as Ryan had brought up earlier, you've got to position the right house on the lot. And so, I mean, if you have a very narrow frontage, you may only be able to get a $5 million house on this lot that makes any sort of sense. I'm imagining Rowayton, for example, quarter acre lots on the Five Mile River in Rowayton. If I were to be able to find one for $5 million, would I be hard pressed to spend more than five on a quarter acre lot in Rowayton? On the construction? No, I bet I bet Mary and Ryan could do it. <laughs> sure, we could. <laughs> but 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 I think it also comes down to what is the size of the lot. I Meaning, if we're talking about Copper Beach Farm, right? That one hundred and thirty-eight million dollars sale that is largely land there. I don't, you know, you're not spending one hundred million dollars recreating that house, whatever the, or however you value it. But in but go to Rowayton, where that that gets completely rebalanced, and and I, I think probably in most places it's a little bit narrower. Uh, of a relationship, certainly, than 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 Copper Beach Farm. That, that's an outlier. But but there is a peninsula in Westport, for instance, that's just been bought and uh, subdivided, and they're talking about $10 million lots. And I think they're two acres. So using that as an example, do you think that those clients are probably building $10 million houses on those $10 million lots because, um, and the outliers might go higher, but nobody's going to go lower. I don't think so. Or if they're going lower, it's not, it's because they want a small house. You know, at, at, at certain point, you know, it could be a 2000 square foot house that has exceptional finishes, but at some point there's a limit to how much you're going to spend. And, and so it's only out of choice. And you know what? They recognize that they're underbuilding for the value of the land. And you guys can probably speak better of that than, than we can. But, but like you look at it and you say, okay, I have $10 million. And I think Scott was losing. I have a $10 million site. I got to build something that's commensurate with this site here. Um, and so I think there is some pressure, so to speak, in the market in that regard. Are there houses that you find in, and I understand the topography is different all the way down the coast, but are there, are there houses that, for example, you would never build uh, in Georgia that you would build in Maine and vice versa? Like, you're like we would never build this house here. And advise a client we just that doesn't work here like all glass does not work you just you can't do it stylistically i think we would like to respond to the local vernacular so if i'm building in maine you know there's a lot of rocky outcroppings i'm going to look at those local materials and use that if i'm building in newport i'm going to use some red brick and do some shingle style that 
maybe harks back to the Isaac Bell house, right? I'm using examples here, but we try to be vernacular. So if I'm building in the South, I'm gonna want a broad porch. Um, but I don't think we would ever take the position that's completely inappropriate. We might suggest, you know what, this seems a little bit out of place. Maybe there's a way to get what you're after and tone it down or whatever. But ultimately, you know, our view is we're going to put options out there. We want the client empowered. This is their house, not our house. This is about a collaboration. This is I mentioned this about the process. Um, and and so we want them to get what they want to get out of it. We're we're trying to guide them. Uh, but it's up to them to pull the trigger and say, you know what, this is where I land and this is really what I want to do. And then it's up to us to do that the best way we can, the most sensitive sure. way. We can. Sure. And Scott, from a building perspective, let's just say there's a, in Maine, you know, they don't build like glass boxes, but someone just is die hard. They've got the money. They want a glass box up there. Are the builders capable of making that shift and doing that? Or do you got to bring builders from somewhere else who specialize in doing that? Well, there's a, there, there's still a lot of learning going on in the contemporary style, and there's a lot of little details that are incredibly difficult to um, put together. And, and you know, using an old example, I mean, if you take a, uh, you know, a, a very tricked out Georgian with lots of moldings and all sorts of plaster and details and things everywhere to attract the eye, you can hide a lot of things in that. So, I mean, if things are a little bit out of level, things aren't quite square, things are off, you can hide things like that everywhere. If you build a truly minimalistic contemporary and you put like negative reveals of like a quarter of an inch that follow and chase everything all around, you can't lose it anywhere. So you literally have to build the entire structure perfectly or the interior is gonna look like crap because if the only detail you see is a quarter inch line and it goes between three eighths and an eighth, it looks like you're, you're a bunch of hacks in there doing it. So those levels of, de of detail, again, and, and in a, a big old Georgia, I mean, you'd never notice. I mean, you'd hide that stuff all over the place. No one would ever find it, even if they got in there with lasers. But in this stuff, I mean, the eye would go right to it. So it's, and, and regardless, again, there, there's, you know, for a, if the same size house is, is 5 million and 10 million, odds are the 10 million has much higher levels of quality and you got to bring in the right guys to do this stuff. Contemporary does have some specialty items to it, and you don't want somebody learning. I mean, waterfront has specialty things because there's all sorts of weather conditions and, and negative pressure and water that gets sucked uphill and goes against gravity and weird things like that. So you don't want somebody learning how to do waterfront on your house, and you don't want to be the, somebody's first contemporary house. I have a two-part question related to some of the things Scott just talked about. Um, insurance, are you looking at, um, when you're designing a home uh, on the water, are you looking at what the insurance might be dictating in terms of how the house needs to be built? And are you finding currently that you're getting some roadblocks there? So um, we usually will factor it in and talk to the clients early on about who their carrier is. And, and those carriers at this point have some pretty standard requirements that we just need to bake in. Oftentimes they're they're more technical in their character. You know, it's it's not driving, put this room there or that room here. Um, but yeah, it's part of the dialogue for sure. Um, a lot of a lot of your clients probably self-insure too, right? Uh, I'm not totally sure. I mean, we hear a lot of that, you know, the AIG private client group or or Chubb, um, you know, the, those level of carriers that are that are doing stuff. But but really, um, then there's the issue of flood insurance, right. which is a separate issue. And that's one where, you know, everybody's ambition should be to get out of the flood zone. It's better for a whole host of reasons. I well, mean, and that's kind of my question. Are you building homes to meet those requirements so that they can get flood insurance? Where we can. There are some places where it's just not tenable to do it, but it's always in everybody's best advantage. And the way the regulations are written, they're, everybody is incentivized to move toward compliance, but it's tricky to do it. Uh, it it's costly. And it also can radically change the character of a house on the site, of a neighborhood, et cetera. Um, and, and so there's, a, I think, rightfully so, a lot of pushback on it. But Mary and I were just talking about the, 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 the historic preservation implications of that. You know. Yeah, no, I, I mean, absolutely. On, on, at least in our local area, um, if, let me, let me get the... How do, well, I mean, there's a limit on how much you can improve a property that's within, yeah. the, within the flood zone. That's like an incentive to demolish 
you know, a historical structure. There's also a lot of the uh, high net worth underwriters are not working in Rowe Eaton right now because they don't want to take the risk anymore. So we have a lot of clients that we're having a hard time finding coverage for. Yeah, we just had a client buying something in, in Tokenique, same situation. And, and it's, it's, it's actually off water, but there's wind risk. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think doesn't mean that these properties are not going to sell or that I hope not. I mean, I, I think the endurance of the lifestyle will, will, will persevere or people are just going to pay more for their coverage. Yeah, thank you. If, you. if you're building new, a lot of the codes take into account things such as uplift. And it drives you crazy when you're building a stone or a brick house with a slate roof on it. And we're spending 50 or or $100,000 tying down the whole structure where you're going. <laughs> I mean, we, we've all had the three little pigs and, 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 and it's not going to blow this house away. And yet that's what the requirements are. It does make sense though that, I mean, like I think we in our insurance show that we talked with, um, you know, the in Florida and other places, you sit there and you look across a whole swath of a neighborhood, and this house is fine, and that house is fine, and this house is gone, and this other one is here. The modern houses built to code, they can withstand a lot, a ton. And I mean, even down like in Row 8 and after Sandy, you would go down and you'd see a, mod, a a new house that was built at 13 feet was the bottom of the um of the joist, and next door was built at 12. At 12. It flooded right through the first floor. At 13, it got up to within about an inch underneath the joists. And you're like, well, I'll be damned. They actually know something. <laughs> right. They got it right. I mean, so this is an it. aha moment for me because I grew up and my aunt was at 45 Rowayton Avenue in Rowayton. And like clockwork, every five years, the water would just go right through the living room and back out the other side. And they'd have to replace the sheetrock on this on this cottage. So are you as architects able to solve that? Are you able to say, well, I mean, we can only build it so much higher in the air um, before we get in trouble with the codes, um, but we've got an awesome set of pumps. It occurs to me that we have not invented the pumps that could that could pump Long Island Sound out of that house fast enough. Uh, so what do you do at 45 Roy and Avenue? Um, because they do have a storm surge problem every couple of years there's not a good solution for you it. raise it yeah you ra you ra <laughs> r-a-i-s-e yeah not r-a-c <laughs> um but but really you pick materials that, that can get wet and then dry off and yeah, like yeah but you don't want living rooms that can get yeah. wet i mean but but exterior so materials much. certainly you want to yeah. be thinking about the um the, the the resiliency to them and also the code really governs a lot of this stuff too. Um, so, you know, we can take certain actions. I think for, from our standpoint, the bigger challenge is if you do raise it, how do you mitigate that? You know, how do you make it feel comfortable? Can, can we just get a quick prediction? Cause it's just, to me, to me, it's the elephant in the room, the rising waters, et cetera, et cetera. In 50 years, these houses, of course, they're gonna be still standing and resilient because they're being built so well now, but are they gonna be viable houses that are gonna have beachfront or, they, or is that all gone? And this might be the last question. We're down to two, less than two minutes. So give every, us a great big crystal ball. Every every great big environmentalist has a beach house. <laughs> <laughs> the hurricane of 1938 wiped out houses along the coast. And guess what? People rebuild. So you know what? Even if they don't last, I suspect 50 years or 100 years from now, people are still going to be living on the water. They might be in different houses, might be in different places. It's too compelling. Some of our clients are already trucking in the sand that they're putting yeah, on their artificial yeah. beach. So eh, not much will change. <laughs> How expensive is that? It's actually not that unreasonable. Yeah, I don't I, know what they it's said. actually really, really interesting science behind it. They get the grain size to match the existing sand so that it lasts longer. I mean, it's really funny stuff. So my final question, is it a good idea to hire a husband-wife team? <laughs> yes, absolutely. absolutely. You should only hire husband wife teams. Yeah, my mom and dad are actually both architects. And I remember growing up with under a husband wife team. Uh, and actually, my sister and I both became architects as a result, because it is so pervasive, you know, they they bring their work home with them every night for better and for worse. Um, but no, I, I, yes. I really enjoy um, working as a husband and wife team in part because you know that when you hire us, we are always working on your job. <laughs> <laughs> we don't leave it at the office at 6 p.m. Um, but no, I think it makes for a better product as well because you've got two pairs of eyes instead of one on everything. And we're always running by um, 
the other person, you know, I'm stuck on this detail. What would you do here? Or we've got this, this issue. And um, so it's productive. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Scott Hobbs. And thank you, Meredith. This has been a great show. Roberto. Thanks, guys. I love thank working with you, Roberto. Another great it. show. 104. Thank you so camp. much, guys. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Bye -bye. Oh, clear. Care. Great Bye -bye. job today, everyone. Take care.